Yeah, looking to the east with Steve Zercher at Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe, Japan, uh, keeping us current on what's going on in Japan, which is one of the favorite, uh, favorite places in the world. Yeah, Hi, Steve. Fun. Good morning. Uh, Good to see you, Jay. Thank you uh, for joining yeah, well, Japan's us. Japan's one of my favorite places as well, obviously. Then you should continue to teach and, and, <laughs> and be, be part of the university there. As far as I know, that's that's going to happen. At least that's my plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I we know, talked be, before the show and it sounded like things were getting better in Japan. Yeah, um, the uh, state of emergency has been lifted in the majority of prefectures in Japan because the infection rates have been going down. Mm -hmm. And even in the major Metro cities like Tokyo and Osaka, uh, the rates are, are beginning to flatten. So um, the policies of the government in, in encouraging people not to work, although many people still worked, uh, when you go out to protect yourself and others by wearing masks and not co uh, congregating in larger groups, all of the same uh, strategies that have been used in the successful countries and states like Hawaii um, seems to have worked. Although we're not really 100% sure why it's worked because for one, in one case, the amount of testing that Japan has done of its citizens is below 1%. It's the lowest of any of the developed countries. Japan had kind of, in essence, an anti-testing strategy from the very beginning. So that was one key element that the Japanese government did not apply uh, to try and thwart the, the virus. But regardless, it, it seems overall to be working. Um, I think in part that's due to the government's actions as half-hearted as they may have been, but also as we talked about before, uh, Japanese culture, uh, I think has some elements to it as well, that certainly wearing masks, which in, in I, can I say this, Jay, in your country, <laughs> that seems to be an issue and people are being harassed and even shot if they're insisting on wearing masks. We don't have that issue in Japan at all. But when you go out now, 95% uh, of the people are wearing masks. Yeah, now, some of that is because of allergies and so forth, but most of that I would imagine is because of the coronavirus. The, the testing troubles me, the lack of testing. And I'm, I'm yeah, actually thought... reminded of, um, of, of some shows we did back 10 years ago uh -huh. uh, involving the Medtronic Corporation, which is an MDT trades on the big board. Yep. I don't know what they're doing right now. And they were trying to get into Japan. Mm. Um, and um, they were having trouble because of cultural things. They, now, these guys were specializing in, in invasive surgery to put heart devices, you know, electronic devices in your heart right. or around your circulatory system. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the medical establishment in Japan, the community in Japan resisted this because they didn't like invasive procedures oh. like that. And I'm wondering if the testing, you know, with the unpleasantness of the swab all the way up into, you know, the top of your, your, your throat there, your throat right. actually, um, is invasive enough to meet with cultural resistance. Is there anything like that happening? Um, as, far as, as far as I can tell, it's not so much cultural issues. Uh, it's more the strategy of the Ministry of Health. Uh, I, I'm going to simplify this, but I, I think their, their thought was that if we do more testing, we're going to find more sick people and it will, it will overwhelm our hospitals. So let's not do testing and wait till people get really, really sick and then we'll accept them into the hospitals. So uh, that in a nutshell is what the strategy was to reduce the amount of testing. And perhaps this is a legacy from the SARS days. But this, this pandemic and, and that one is completely different. You know, SARS, the numbers were relatively limited. This is, you know, millions now. So uh, the strategy was outdated, but yet they stuck to it, even though they were pretty harshly criticized by the WHO and other medical organizations. There has been some lifting of this uh, strict requirement to get testing, but still... It, uh, Sorry, Jay, that's a mosquito flying around me here. Mosquitoes are not affected by the virus, apparently. They're, they're still doing quite well. Things are warming up here in Japan. Uh, but anyway, I, they've changed their strategy uh, a little bit now because they're recognizing that they're asympt asymptomatic people walking around, potentially spreading the disease, and they're not being found because there is really no active 
testing, like for example, in Korea, a part of Korea's strategy was testing everybody. And that really, really helped. So Korea's results uh, are much better than Japan's. I think yeah, it worked better. We had a show on it two hours ago mm -hmm. uh, involving a, a Korean um, law professor who teaches here. Oh, okay. Um, uh, who, who spoke of, um, you know, what the procedures were in Japan. I'm sorry, in Korea. And yeah. uh, clearly they were focused on testing. They tried the CDC uh, type tests at first. Those failed. Then they invented their own test and, and then they put these uh, temporary testing areas together all around the country right and it worked uh, they it really they really lowered the numbers dramatically hey korea is so <laughs> only the testing it was you know korea, korea is playing baseball and japan is not so <laughs> there's your signal they've well, gotten it, to the point where they can actually have that and uh, in japan we're still waiting for baseball to start they they see what uh, when I, I think this is a missing link in public thinking uh it's not just the testing it's what you do with the tests mm. uh it's the tracking and it's when you find somebody who's been exposed or has a disease what do you do about that person right um and so korea has all these systems and and people abide by it um and they're and they're in one mind they are all together on it from right. the government to the business to the universities to the individual citizens are all together on it and when people get together on this kind of thing i think it works really well yeah. it obviously doesn't work so well in the u.s <laughs> no uh I, I was a general manager for a software company uh in korea for a few years um so i really enjoyed living in, and working there and my observation is the same as what you stated uh, korea number one is so unbelievably connected through technology way more than anything you can imagine or anything that exists in, in where i live in japan so people find out about things instantaneously so it, it's a part of Korean culture to share information, but then it's multiplied by technology. Everyone is connected to each other. Everyone finds out everything instantly. And it creates a, a kind of mass consensus process. So just very briefly, the, where I really saw this very clearly, um, I was working in Korea during the, the World Cup when it was hosted by Japan and Korea. And the Korean team was doing terribly. So I went to the World Cup ticket office and I asked, I'd like to buy a ticket. And they said, oh, we have tickets for the final. I said, there's tickets for the World Cup final still available. It was because the Korean team was doing poorly. So the consensus was, we're not going to go see them. We're not interested in the World Cup. And then they won a couple games. I went to the ticket office a week or so later, all sold out. So it just switched just like that. Korean's team was awful. Oh, they're good. Now we want to follow them and all the tickets were sold out immediately. It was just, it just shocked me. So I didn't yeah, get very... tickets to the final because I couldn't, they wouldn't accept my credit card the first time I went. <laughs> but that's an interesting aspect of Korean culture. And that's yeah. part of, you know, Asian sense of community and collectivism as, as Hofstede talks about. The culture leans in that direction. But I think yeah. Korea, because of technology, is just the most furthest out in terms of building that group consensus in the country. So in the U.S. now, um, thanks to uh, Dr. Trump, I call him Dr. Trump because I know he must have medical knowledge there somewhere. Um, you know, we, we have a, a call to return. Uh, I quote, we're back. Uh, we haven't done anything, but we're back. Mm. And uh, we're going to reopen the economy. Whatever the reality is, we're going to find out. Right. whether it works, it doesn't work, or whether we'll have a second wave or more. But, you know, the, the question really is, um, how is it going to work in terms of coming back? Because uh, we've been away from an active economy, a national economy, mm. for, what, three months, thereabouts. Right. Um, and Japan has been pretty much in the same, the same place. And um, so you can say that uh, it's no longer a national emergency. You can say the numbers are down. You can say that people are now able to go out uh, mm -hmm. and, I don't know, continue uh, entertainment and work, what have you. But, mm -hmm. but my question to you, Steve, is um, how is the reopening going to work in Japan? Uh, is Japan uh, ready to bounce back into a vital economy such as it was? or is it going to take a little time? What, what are the considerations? 
Yeah, I, I think as, as opposed to what I have been able to read and, and uh, understand about the U.S. policies, I know it varies by state, right? Because it's the governors who are making the final decision on this. And that's also true here in Japan. It's, it's the governors of the prefectures, which is the equivalent of the state. But um, there's more of a sense of a staged process here, a more incremental process. Uh, it's not we're going from closed to open. That's not going to happen. So in the prefectures that are beginning to open up things, it's step by step. So some businesses can open, uh, some still cannot. And let's see how this goes. It's it's more of a measured process, uh, I think, than just saying, okay, now we're back to normal. So everybody just go back and do what you did before. That That's not how it's being administered or how the policy is being done here. We're, we're still under a state of emergency, even though it's been lifted in uh, various prefectures at various levels, depending on the instruction from the, the governor. So it's a much more kind of a step-by-step -step approach, I think, which is probably wiser because there's always the risk of the infections taking off again. And there's a sense that if that does happen, then the restrictions will come back, back in place uh, quickly. You have to be nimble. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I like that approach because it, the messaging there is that we're trying this out. We're not sure it's going to work. If it doesn't, we're going to be watching it very carefully. Yeah. Uh, if it doesn't work, we're going back to previous um, previous controls. Yeah, this is true at the general level, but it's also true at the industry segment level. Uh, I was on a call a few days ago with the Consul General uh, and also um, for, with the ACCJ, the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. And uh, we've been focusing on the tourism industry. And as you know, I, I built a hospitality management program at, at uh, Kansai Gaidai. And uh, we're, we were thinking, how can us, the consulate and the American Chamber of Commerce, help the tourism industry come back from, from you know, near death? The, the, the tourism, the foreign tourism has gone down by 99.4%. Wow, wow. It, it is just completely evaporated. Well, that right? sounds like Japan, Hawaii, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Hawaii has the same issue. I'm sure the people uh, at the Hawaiian Tourism Agency or other agencies in in uh, the Hawaiian government are trying to figure out how do we introduce tourism back in a safe manner. So uh, that's something that's a challenge for us that are focused on the tourism industry. That in particular has been heavily damaged by the coronavirus. So we don't have an answer yet on that. I mean, how do, how, Jay, how would I convince you to get on a plane and come to Japan? I mean, there's many steps that we're going to have to go through to make you feel that it's safe to do and that you're willing to fly in a plane and come to a country when this virus has been uh, not as bad as the United States, but still it's, it's here and there's a risk for traveling in this country like many, many other countries. Well, let's, I don't know let's, unpack, the, let's unpack that because uh, the same yeah. issue exists here in Hawaii. Right. Um, so the first thing it has to be is that your air, your air flight has to be reasonably safe. I don't think the airlines get this yet because they're not separating people on the planes. Maybe some airlines are, some aren't. Yeah, um, Emirates. Until last week, they were not requiring people to wear masks on the planes. Yeah. So that, that's going to keep me off a plane. I'm not going to do that. Right. Emirates uh, announced, Emirates Airlines, uh, that they will test people before they get on the plane. But they're the only one that I've heard of that's done that. So well, before I think there's a lot of... There's a lot of progress on fast tests. Um, the Korean professor I talked to this morning said that, uh, you know, they had achieved like a five or 10 minute test cycle. Yeah. And they could test anybody who wanted to be tested, just like Trump said about the U.S. Um, and, and that really helps. And I think that that is what the world is demanding now. Right. So what's happening in Emirates is probably going to happen in other places. Too. I would imagine that that would be the step that the airline would take in order to assure people that once you get on the plane, you're not going to be infected. Yeah. And, and it's not only they're testing you, they're testing the guy in the next seat. Or yeah, two everybody. seats away, you know. Right. So that, I think it's going to change the airline industry. It's probably going to make tickets more expensive. But hey, I, I'd rather pay that than, you know, than, than get sick. Right. The other thing is, uh, so how about the country itself? Uh, I'd be looking at the curves in the other country. 
Right. Uh, I'd be looking at the way they handle things. I'd be looking at the peop the number of people with masks. I'd be looking at the way they handle uh, my experience in a restaurant mm -hmm. or in an entertainment uh, venue. Mm -hmm. um, and if I if if I had a good feeling about it, or if, if the press reported that the experience is um, you know it engenders confidence and a sense of safety, mm -hmm. then I would be much more likely to go. Mm. Uh, and, and it has to be not only good, but it has to be excellent. It has to be better than other travel venues. Right. Then I would go. And, you know, we had a conversation with uh, another fellow today. And how does that work in Hawaii? Well, Hawaii has to not only return to tourism, but it has to return to the, the safest tourism in the world. A, a sense of excellent, of outstanding safety. It's mm -hmm. not so easy. Right. Um, but yeah, Japan I think those can do that. Yeah, I think the questions you're asking, the points you're making are the ones that uh, Japan, uh, the hotel industry, the airline industry, all the, the subsequent the parts of that tourism equation are going to have to figure out how to prove exactly that to prospective visitors to this country. And Hawaii has to do that as well. It's a worldwide challenge right now because yeah, yeah. tourism is such a big part. It was edging into 7% of the Japanese GDP, it was, it was expected to go to 10% in the next five years. It's, you know, it's gone, it's a huge setback right now. But once we're, I think, able to make that case and people feel more comfortable traveling, then it should be the most vibrant industry in Japan again. Uh, it was before Corona came. Who, who are the people who come to Japan for, you know, as a tourist destination? Well, before coronavirus, it was worldwide. If you if you go to Kyoto, uh, before this was occurring, and you're just walking around the streets, it's like Manhattan. Mm -hmm. You hear every single language. You hear Russian and German and French and Korean and Chinese. It was it was a huge draw for people all over the world. If you looked at the the aggregate numbers, though, it was primarily Asian. And the majority would be Chinese and Korean. Those are the two largest groups. Uh, so Chinese tourism is zero now. And Korean tourism actually dropped off before coronavirus because of political tensions that exist between the two countries. This is another example of the Korean consensus. You know, once the word came out from the Korean government that Japan's not our friend anymore, don't go, zoom. The, the tourism rates just went way down because Koreans said, we're, we're not going to go to Japan anymore. And furthermore, we're not even going to buy Japanese goods in, in Korea. That that was another aspect of this tension. Which what occurred. was troubling them? Yeah. So, what was troubling them? Um, uh, various, it's, it's a long history, a long tension that exists between Japan and Korea coming out of the colonization of Korea and also uh, World War II. So issues like comfort women, the sexual slavery that the Japanese military uh, orchestrated, uh, which is still denied in, in many parts of Japanese society and to some extent by the Abe administration. So that's uh, very uh, infuriating for the Koreans. So there's still Korean women that, I mean, they're really old now, but they went through this experience and they get up and they talk about what happened to them. So it's very clear that this was an orchestrated uh, effort by the Japanese government and some Japanese academics have reported on that as well. Uh, also the history between the two countries and the, the, the colonization of Korea. Was it a, a like the article that you sent to me uh, about the beneficial influence of Japan in China, that, that sense that uh, Korea benefited from, uh, from the Japan occupation? So you hear that periodically. That's been kind of quiet, but every once in a while, a Japanese politician will say something along those lines, and that gets reported into the Korean press, and it just really makes the Korean people upset. There's there's a tremendous still it antipathy. It doesn't sound true at all, by the way. Yeah, I know, I know. But <clears throat> yeah, the first time I went to Korea, it was in the late '70s, and I spoke Japanese, and uh, the owners of the hostel where I stayed were old enough that they were actually trained to speak Japanese because when Japan occupied Korea, they tried to eliminate the Korean language. They, they say, you're gonna speak Japanese now, not, not your native language. So she could understand everything that I was saying, but she would not speak. She just refused. Yeah. She, she could have, but it was such an emotional thing for her that she just didn't yeah. want to speak I, that language again. I know again. people like that too.
Yeah. So what about China? You mentioned that the Chinese are not coming to Japan these days. Yeah. And I, I get a, a couple of questions in my mind. One is maybe that's okay with some Japanese because the Chinese, uh, you know, maybe they're sick. Uh, maybe they still have the virus, although uh, it sounds like the, the Chinese have got it controlled right now. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is this is this phenomenon that we see with Trump, uh, where he is, uh, first he's engaged in the tariff war, that was before the virus, and now he's engaged in a war of words with Xi Jinping, um, blaming, everybody blaming each other, and, mm. and, and really ruining our foreign policy with the country, ruining it. Um, and I wonder if Japan is inheriting some of that. Um, well, uh, yes, to some extent, because Japan's foreign policy, foreign strategy, usually is in lockstep with the United States. And that comes out of World War II. It's been that way for decades. For example, uh, there's this issue uh, with the WHO as to whether or not to let Taiwan in as an observer. Right? So America is advocating for that to try and use that as a, a way of fighting with, with China, because China obviously believes in the one China that don't really see Taiwan as a separate country, and therefore they should not be in the UN or any other, other kinds of international organizations. Uh, but Japan is supporting that as well. So they're in lockstep when it comes to those political issues. But the fact is that China is the number one trading partner for Japan. It has been the number one trading partner for Japan for seven, eight, nine years now. I'm still, that's true even today, post Corona. So Japan's uh, kind of in this difficult situation where when it comes to foreign policy and politics, they look to Washington DC and they always have. And Abe and Trump, as you know, are buddies, they play golf together, all of that. But when it comes to economics, uh, the connection is more with China. But Abe uh, now, and I, I see that Trump is also following this, is trying to de-invest in China to some extent. Part of it has to do with the political tension between the US and China, and also between Japan and China. And part of it is that I think they've recognized that they were over-dependent on Chinese sources for their manufactured products. It would be better to have their manufacturing base more diversified. So the Japanese government has actually created a fund to help Japanese companies who have manufacturing sites in China to exit from China. So it's, it's gotten to that point where the Japanese government is actively funding disinvestment by helping Japanese companies move out of China and set up their manufacturing. What Abe wants, of course, is in Japan, but it'll probably be some other location other than China yeah, because yeah, the costs yeah. of doing business in Japan are quite high. Well, it's ironic, you know, um, that in, in the U.S. Uh, there's been this need for masks and, um, you know, you get the, the ladies in the sewing circle are making masks, but mm. there's not a lot of original manufacturing of masks going on in this country. And, and uh, he, as, as I understand it, he hasn't uh, applied, um, activated the Defense Production Act to make masks. Mm -hmm. um, but the, and, and then the states have, and, the, and the hospitals have been competing on a limited supply to buy a limited supply of masks mm. and that raises the price of masks um so the federal government wanted to buy masks and they wanted to buy hundreds of millions of masks which is a good thing but there's no place they could buy them from except china yeah okay and, and then you have also the thing about the uh, the mask the quality of the mask there was an article recently i saw about how there were some scammers uh, in China uh, making scam, scam low quality masks. The whole mm. thing is really a sad story that mm. although we're fighting with them, um, we, we have no choice but to buy masks from them in a time of crisis. It's so interesting what's happening. And mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I think, I don't think that's going to change. I don't think that this is going to result in um, you know, a new, a new uh, level of manufacturing in the United States. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's my suspicion as well, that uh, these types of uh, symbolic investments or statements is probably temporary because yeah. in the end, the business has driven by its costs and right. it, it's trying to increase its profits. And if you can manufacture something still in China at a lower rate in a more reliable way, 
I mean, what is Apple going to do? My goodness, you know, so much of Apple's sourcing is in China. They've been very quiet on this issue. So, yeah. but anyway, Jay, if, if we can move to another topic, maybe not quite so serious. And uh, there's this discussion, I've uh, read it in various articles about the a new post-corona lifestyle in Japan. So we've talked a little bit about this before that because of this crisis, there's been kind of a lifting of the normal pressures on Japanese business and Japanese societies to remain pretty much doing things as they've always done it, mm. right? For example, um, uh, we talked about the hanko or the chop in the last show, that that's something the Japanese business still does. It's 2000 year old technology. So there's been some effort by the government to say, look, let's move beyond that. We, we clearly see through the lens of this pandemic that that kind of practice is outdated it's forcing people to come to work when we were saying, don't come to work, but they have to come to work because they put their chop on, on these papers. Um, so there's this discussion about how things were going to change in Japan as a result. So this new lifestyle issue, then there's some positive aspects to that, like this change in business, also maybe a de-emphasis of the business card. Jay, have you been to Japan? Well, I remember the whole thing about the business card. We yeah, had so that you know how Hawaii important. For and through the 80s and into the 90s, it was a whole ritual with the business card. Yeah, very, very important part of Japanese business culture. And uh, that's now being looked at. All of that can be replaced by technology overnight. You, you don't need the actual paper cards. You don't need the introduction process. So that's a couple examples of some potential changes. And, and but for that matter, you don't need uh, having a dozen, a dozen uh, managers uh, sitting around a table and uh, when one would suffice. This this happened in, <laughs> in Hawaii. When they were here buying hotels and the like in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, it would never be one person. It would always be, would always, it was always be a group of a dozen people. And the way you could tell who was in charge was he never said anything. That's right. But he had a young woman with him who attended, <laughs> who attended to his personal needs. Right. And, he, and she would traipse along behind him. If you looked at the young woman, then you would find out who was running the group. Yeah. <laughs> My experiences as well. And when I was negotiating with Itachi and I worked for Hewlett Packard, uh, it was the same type of thing. Uh, but there is some focus now on that. Um, Companies are beginning to recognize that the evaluation process, which is usually based on longevity and uh, how many hours you put in at the company, it's a, me it's a measurement of time invested. It's not a measurement of effectiveness or your accomplishments. This is kind of built in, baked into the Japanese business culture. But there are companies now, and it's being accelerated somewhat by this recent experience over the last three months, to recognize that hey, people are, are now working remotely. And guess what? They're getting their work done. And in some cases, they're actually doing more than when they're sitting in the office pretending to do work. Um, so there's some changes that are occurring. Some companies are beginning to say, look, we're not going to evaluate on time any longer. We're going to evaluate on results. So some companies- This is a companies, major change. It is. It's, it's happening around the edges, but it's been uh, catalyzed by this, this coronavirus. That's one positive. These are positive things. Now, one negative thing, which I, I found interesting, is that uh, <laughs> when, when this all started going down, Jay, you know, I'm, I'm a professor, so I have a freedom of, of time. So I stay at home and I, I go out and I spend time with my kids and so forth. So um, I would walk out and I would see couples with their kids. The husbands were being told, don't go to work, right? So they were actually in the home. And the wife would be looking very, very, the mother, very happy because her husband was with her. And then I'd look at the husband. Do I have to do this? You know, they had that, do I have to do this face? <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden they were thrown into a domestic role because they were working out of the home. And the wife was saying, hey, you need to help me take care of the kids and so forth. So. Uh, there was an article actually in the New York Times about a Japanese couple. I saw it. Is, is, wasn't that interesting? So it's the husband began to complain because, hey, I'm doing my chores. And then the wife came out with a detailed list. It said, yeah, you do 21 things. I do 210 things. <laughs> so Japanese men, partly because of the requirement of this time 
nature of business have been working for long hours and they don't do much in the home. It's, I think the average is 20 minutes they put in a day doing domestic chores. But now they're in the home and the wife is saying, hey, you know, in many cases, the wives are working as well. So we need to share responsibility. So now there's a, the Corona divorce effect that's <laughs> beginning to take place. Actually in China, that was one of the, when the, when the lockdown was lifted, the divorce rate went up. So that's uh, may happen here in Japan. I don't know about Hawaii, Jay. My wife's actually upstairs here. So I have to be careful about talking about this. I don't know what, what's, what situation you're in Jay. Uh, with your wife, given the lockdown and so forth. But. Well, the day of the day of the Donison is over. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's true. It, it, it you know, it's like uh, COVID, you know, reveals uh, so many things about so many aspects of our lives, including exactly uh, what our marriages are made of, uh, yeah. and that's that's a lesson from you know, not only China but everywhere. Yeah. So, Steve, we, I think we're out of time. I'm sorry yeah. to say it because I really love these conversations. But <laughs> I do, too. It goes by so quickly. Yeah, well, life goes by so quickly. That's that's one of the strange things about being locked up. Um, yeah, so I, I did. Yeah, meld into each other. Yeah, I won't be able to make it out this summer. As, uh, I, it looks like the quarantine is going to be extended probably through the summer. This is what I'm hearing through the University of Hawaii. So I'll be teaching my classes remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, and I'll still be here. So, no, no martinis, no uh, safe social distance enjoyment of uh, of the, that drink that we were planning to do. But uh, anyway, I look forward. Maybe next year when things calm down and okay. travel is uh, is we we achieve those hurdles that people feel comfortable traveling. But we can keep talking, Steve, and we will. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Steve Zercher, Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe. Thank yep. you so much for joining us. Aloha. My pleasure.